Good evening. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? <coughs> I didn't bring my speaker today, so if you have a question, please, or if there's a dialogue happening between you and myself, please speak up as much as you can. Anything to share? Over the last couple of days, I've been having, I guess what I would call a realized experience, or what, I, I, all of a sudden, all this talk about being a spiritual being, having a human experience, makes, I mean, total sense, in that I realize I've spent whatever time I've done in this identity trying to figure out what it is we do here. And, you know, I've, I've been sitting with that today and going that that's really sort of not um, a mainstream way of being. But kind of in reality, we're all doing that, only somehow or other I got to, to peek at the book. Um, you know, but it, it, it's it's just so strange to have it not be a story. I mean, does that make sense to you what I'm trying to say? It, it's just like, it's really kind of odd. But I just needed to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And that it's okay. It's just that. Great. So. Well, congratulations. Or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. It, it, it's what's interesting about it is that it makes everything seem a whole lot less awkward somehow. Mm -hmm. nice. it, there's not a judgment or a blame or a deficiency. It's just a showing up thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Nice. Thank Very you. nice. Good. Thanks for sharing. I'd also like to ask you to expound even further on the money discussion that's been going on on the forum, that I asked a question to which you gave us a very lovely teaching, and then there was another that came up um, in the last 24 hours or so about money. Um, I haven't gotten the mantra memorized, but I would love for you to flesh that out a little bit for us, if you could, sure. because it's a big one for me. <coughs> Let me bring everyone up to date then.
So here's what I wrote on Facebook uh, yesterday. It's called The Challenge of Money. The idea of money offers all of us such a beautiful learning opportunity in so many different ways. I love it. Without money, life would be boring. Possibly very good as well, but for now the existence of money will do. It is bound to disappear anyway, so enjoy the catalyst while it's still here to offer you quantum leaps in your own awakening and evolution. <clears throat> here follows a little secret that can resolve any challenge you may experience around the concept of money. Memorize it as a mantra, if you will, and use it throughout the day whenever you are worried about money, pissed off at money, begging for money, in lack of money, jealous at others for having money, pitying those who don't, afraid of money, or whatever other state you perceive yourself to be in, in relationship to the idea of money. So here goes. Say the following statement to yourself a few times per day out loud and ponder its truth. Money does not exist apart from me. Literally. Money does not exist apart from me. Literally. Money does not exist <laughs> apart from me. Literally. <laughs> See what it does for you when you take this to heart and once it becomes truly experiential for you, it resolves everything both your negative feelings toward it, your greed for it, as well as your practical lack of it. I'll leave it a bit mysterious for now. See what you can come up with for yourself by using this mantra in your everyday life until it sinks in as an experiential reality where you can actually feel viscerally that there is no money apart from you, your state of being, your beliefs and your decisions. What about it? <laughs> do you understand? I don't think I do entirely. And, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, am I being an understanding junkie here? I mean, I know that there's, there's some of us who are that way. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of them. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out from the wording of it, how to experience it energetically, because I don't experience things from a thought so much as from a mm -hmm. kinesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to clear up one idea, it is true that money and you are one and the same, but it's not necessarily, I didn't necessarily mean it in the non-dual sense. There was somebody that commented on it, I think Liz, uh, that made that sort of distinction. So when I say there is no money apart from you, I don't mean you and money are one in the non-dual sense, like everything is the same. Okay. What I mean by there is no money apart from you is in the relative sense. So in relationship to money, money in your life does not exist apart from you, your beliefs, your decisions, your state of being. That means that, for example, one of the most practical examples in line with my teaching would be that people keep postponing their passions acting on their passions because of a lack of money, because of no money. So they say, yeah, okay, but I'll have to wait for the money first. But if you wait for the money, since there is no money apart from you, the money's going to wait for you. Does that make sense? Yes. And when you make a decision, voila, the next day suddenly you get an email or whatever it is, or somebody sponsors you, or through whatever way, shape, or form, but you get the money you need to go there. So money is not something that exists. It's not an independent object that is thrown within this world. It is inseparable from the game world itself. It's inseparable from the fabric of the illusion itself, which is made up by you, consciousness. It's and made it's a up. function of the belief then, right? It is absolutely a function of the belief. There is, you cannot absolutely not find money apart from yourself, apart from your state of being, apart from your beliefs, apart from your ideas, apart from the fabric of consciousness, there is no money. Money is not an object you have to wait for because it doesn't exist like that. It only exists as a result of your decisions. So when you make a decision, you either get the money or you don't or whatever. But that money or any form, you can replace this with pretty much anything that's sort of, let's say, material or, um, or just abundance, the idea of abundance in general or the idea of your life flowing, like the circumstances and the practicalities, that's another big one. Oh, I just have to wait for the practicalities to, 
to change or the circumstances to change. You can replace money by circumstances, if you will. There are no circumstances apart from you. So whenever you're making a decision, it's very helpful to remember that, to say that a few times to yourself, okay, if you're waiting for, for example, money, say to yourself, there is no money apart from me, literally. Not just metaphorically, literally. There is no money. Money does not exist apart from me. It's completely dependent. The way it shows up is completely dependent upon me, my decisions, my etc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you're passionate about something and something makes you feel like you're coming alive, don't wait. Basically that's the message. Don't wait. Don't wait for practicalities. Don't wait for circumstances because they're waiting for you. They don't exist. If you say, I'm waiting for the money to show up, it never will because there is no money to show up apart from your decisions <coughs> and you haven't decided to make that move therefore you don't need that money <coughs> see what i mean mm -hmm. um so yeah that abundance the flow of life itself the blow the flow of abundance itself won't show up in alignment with your passions if you're not being in alignment with your passions if you're not being in the flow of yourself if you're not being your authentic self and acting on what makes you come alive from within then these things also won't change does that make sense so when every time you worry about money just realize there is no money apart from you so how much money you get or how much abundance you get or how how flowy the circumstances become depends not on the circumstances but on you the decision you make in that very moment and how we feed the mirror yes exactly so, you could also s maybe simplify it by saying there is no money apart from my decisions. Money does not exist apart from my decisions. So if you're not making a decision in favor of your joy, you won't see the circumstances follow. And money is inseparable from the flow of circumstances, from the fabric of circumstances. And the fabric of circumstances is part of you. Thus it all comes back to you. The question is never like what do you have that you can do this amount of your passions with? You know, the primary question is how much of my passions do I want to live? How much of my passions am I ready to live? And then decide to go for those passions in full faith that circumstances are a reflection of your decisions. And so you'll start to actually experience viscerally that there is no money apart from you and that therefore in a sense you control your bank account through your decisions does that make sense so um, that's not to necessarily be mistaken with although feel free to apply it like that i don't necessarily have experience with this because it's not necessarily my joy to do this but my point isn't necessarily like okay i want a hundred thousand in my bank account by tomorrow what i mean is that's again putting circumstances before your passion it's again putting the money as a reason for as it, as if it's the separate independent existence but the the idea is that we simply choose what we are in love with the most and by choosing what we are in love with the most in that sense we control our bank account because the money will show up to be able to do that to be able to live that dream does that make sense to clarify it? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Any questions on that? Any doubts? Any experiences? Any doubts? Would you really love to go to wherever next week or tomorrow or tonight? Would you like to just take your car and drive somewhere or would you like to book a, fla book a flight to wherever? Or Maybe it's not a locational thing, maybe you just want to set something out for it. Is there something you really want to do but you're not doing because you're putting practicalities and waiting for the money as if it's something apart from your decision-making state of being right here in front of just simply making the decision?
Um, well, it, I, I had already kind of made the decision to go with my passion about it, but I'm probably going to get a new car, probably a new used car, but new to me <laughs> soon. But part of me was trying to say, oh, but practicalities and, you know, I should, you know, I've been out, I was out of work for so long, now I'm working, <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, I should, you know, really wait till I catch up, but I, I really want to get a new car. And, um, and I decided that's what I'm going to do. And, nice. um, and it actually feels really good. And, yes, it and does. so it was like, oh, this practical part, but, um, but the, the passion and the excitement and joy of it, it won. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm really good. good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That's great. That way you prevent yourself from becoming a zombie and then ending up at spiritual teachings, trying to rediscover yourself. <laughs> Rediscovering zombie. <laughs> <laughs> if we were all just taught to live this way, and that we know that circumstances aren't real, only we are our decisions, our state of being. If we realize that from the beginning, we would never come to non-dual meetings. We would never come to those kind of things because we'd already be in alignment with that way of living and we'd already have access to those realizations of happiness, joy, freedom, oneness, unity, etc. It would be very, very easy. But because we've lowered our frequency to such a dulled out dependent upon this idea of an external world that isn't even there, state of being, we become depressed, we become burned out, we become separated, isolated, and we become seekers for something better, which is great, but it wouldn't have been necessary if we simply learned to put our joys, our passion, our everything that excites us, that feels in alignment with who we are on a core level. If we put that in front of everything else, if we had learned to live that way, your life would now be so ecstatic. You can't even imagine what your life would now have been like if you would have lived that way moment by moment, moment by moment, moment by moment, ever since childhood. You wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be flying somewhere or whatever. Not in a plane, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no telling you know, what's possible if we keep riding that upward spiral. And the idea of that upward spiral is that it starts small and it feels like it needs some pushing in the beginning because we're coming from that very densified, zombified state. And so it takes a lot of effort to sort of wake up a little bit and a little bit more and, you know, and, oh, I need to go again. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a big boulder that you want to roll across the street, but it doesn't have any momentum yet because you've accepted that state of desolation for so long. But if you keep rolling it, it goes faster, 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 faster. So that's the acceleration in a sense. That upper spiral becomes wider and wider in its angle or increases its vibration. Does that make sense? So for those that ask critical questions about teachings like this, from a rather non-dual or traditional point of view, <coughs> like, what does this have to do with satsang? Or what does this have to do with Ramana Maharshi? Or what does this have to do with anything Buddhism tells us, or whatever? <coughs> if you find yourself critical of the idea of living in the moment, living your joy, then remember that you wouldn't even ask that question, you wouldn't even have that comparison if you would have been living that joy. You wouldn't even be looking for Buddhism. You, wouldn't, you would not have even been looking for non-duality. <coughs> Again, it's a result from not living your enlightened life, from not living your lightened up life. So you're being critical and you're being non-dually accurate or spiritually accurate or traditionally accurate or addicted to certain ways of teaching or certain teachings because you're unhappy because you've blocked yourself up it's the only reason <coughs> so if you notice that in yourself simply lighten up if you want to you don't have to but it's worth it 
<coughs> simply lighten up and start living authentically in your joy and see the value of that. When you compare it to like, yeah, but let's talk more about oneness and about the disappearance of the ego. That's not possible if you're not living your joy. Because if you talk about these matters while you're not living your joy, <coughs> you're only talking about self-deprivation and an idea of blotting out the ego or whatever. And that won't work. It will just cause more separation within yourself, even if it's called union or reunion or disappearance. There needs to be joy, there needs to be bliss. I know that also many teachers have gotten into this groove lately of saying like, bliss has nothing to do with it or it's not about bliss, but it is. <coughs> it is entirely about bliss because existence is made up out of bliss only. So if there is no bliss, you're not doing something right. It's just staying intellectually or it's staying into this rigid, within this rigid framework of what spirituality or enlightenment <coughs> means or how it should look like according to those teachers and those teachers teachers and those teachers teachers and those teachers teachers or whatever according to the books but a life without bliss without overflowing ecstasy is not worth really living it's not worth putting that lower than anything else doesn't mean that bliss always has to be our image of, you know, jumping around like a crazy idiot. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be very peaceful. It can be very non-dual. You know. A non-dual realization or a non-dual frequency of love or freedom or peace or just uh, a oneness of all things, that itself is bliss too. Bliss has many facets, just like a prism or diamond has many facets many sides of the same diamond. So too bliss or ecstasy or presence or existence has many shapes. But don't limit yourself only to that part that we would call whatever you'd call it. But don't limit yourself to one facet of the diamond and then frown upon the facets on the other side of the diamond and say like, hey, that's not, that's not accurate. Start living all the, all the sides <coughs> as they come, moment by moment. Choose whatever resonates most. One time it may be peace or checking out of reality. Falling asleep or going beyond or whatever. And sometimes it may be being, what's the word, extravagantly happy like a little kid, just like whew, overflowing about taking action or doing something in the world. Those are also parts of that same diamond. So there's this whole wide spectrum of it. One facet is not more accurately oneness than anything else. Anything that feels really, really authentically whole and good, whatever it is, whether it's outward, inward, sightwards, upwards, downwards, diagonally, is realization, is more of yourself, living more of yourself. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Who else? experience this week. Could uh, you speak as loud as I, you can? I had an interesting uh, week. Actually, would you mind sitting here? Sure. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. <coughs> um, I had an interesting week. Uh, and a big part of it is a continuation of my exploration of awareness. Um, and last week I used the term hot seat I felt like I was in the hot seat a little bit as I was speaking with you and uh, had the experience of the, the question do you feel worthy give up on the idea of worthiness it, and the hope for worthiness or the feeling of worthiness because that duality is my own creation which can be transcended to, and you use the um, 
the visual mental idea of um, of the layers of, of states of being where within one layer the game is the game and whatever you do in that game you're playing that game and to step into mm. to um, this other game that to my normally aware self is kind of an unknown mm -hmm. for me. Um, so I meditated and toyed with that idea through sitting or just day-to-day -day action. Mm -hmm. And what I found was I felt like my own mind and certain aspects well, I, I came to these limitations of mind itself. Like the, 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 I felt like a blind person and a big, there was a fence around me in, the, in, in a big area. Mm -hmm. And I, have, I chose to walk as far as I could walk until I blindly found mm -hmm. the fence. And I had a lot of mental realizations of the limitations of my current awareness and I felt trapped by my own mind. Well, how do I get beyond my mind? I can't think past that. It's unknown. I don't know. How will I know if I know it? I don't know. But I feel like this is the edge right here and I felt like I bumped into paradoxes, um, mental paradoxes. And just could barely seem to maybe kind of try to reach beyond this invisible fence. And um, I actually feel like walking to that fence and being, aha, this, this is the edge, mm -hmm. was amazing. And it's a big perspective change, and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the leap to the other side is something that I'm finding I haven't discovered yet. And um, previous to last Tuesday, I, on my own, without even really being aware of what the idea of unconditional or universal love was, came to my own understanding and looked it up on the internet, and sure enough, there's all this stuff that was telling me exactly what I mm -hmm kind of discovered about and I thought to myself okay I need to pay attention to this concept at least at this point it's just a concept of unconditional love as the essence of everything mm. and I feel like I need to get past this barrier that I sense with my mind of my mind to try to become more aware and then encompass and become co closer or more one. And I'm um, not having, tr I wouldn't say trouble, but I'm, that's a point that which I think of that I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I can al relate almost everything to that if I choose to take the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Every experience or anything that seems to come up in a reading or a, mm -hmm. a teaching or um, and I was wondering, uh, this is totally changing, we're well, not totally changing the subject, but I was wondering if there's any, I don't know if this is a good term, tricks of the trade or um, any gu guideposts to experientially becoming beyond this self that feels mm -hmm. like it's constricted. Mm -hmm. Are you behind or in front of the obstacle? I think I'm in front of the obstacle. And what's on the other side? A type, uh, an awareness that is myself, that I've forgotten, that somehow knows in a way that a mind and the mental egoic mind doesn't, can't. No. And 
Is that not already noticed? Are you being noticed right now? Is the obstacle being noticed? Mm -hmm. It is. If you're seeing an obstacle, are you obstacled? Not as much, I would say. Less, less so, because now I'm aware that it's there. In fact, you're entirely an obstacle by the obstacle, if you see it. The only thing that seems to be stuck within that fence is the idea that you are actually looking at the fence from the inside out, seeing it as a barrier, but you're actually witnessing it from the outside in already. Your awareness, where you're standing from, is actually already looking at the fence as just another perception within its own view. But within that view also, you project maybe a body-mind idea that then feels like it's stuck within that realm that I just discovered, that edge. But you're not looking at the fence from a position of being stuck. You're looking at the fence from awareness itself, and awareness itself can never be stuck. Can you see that? So in a sense, witness the obstacle in your mind, witness the fence, and then notice, turn your attention around 180 degrees, and ask where you're looking from, and see if that is at all fenced in, or if it's just looking at the entire fence. I find that I think I have begun to be able to do that, but it takes some very quieting, sitting, focused shifting of my perception. Oh, okay. Well, after a while, you become more confident in it, and you'll just have to remind yourself of it, and then it's like, ah, oh, yeah, of course. How can? How could it be otherwise? So maybe even though you see it, you can fully believe it yet. Mm -hmm. But that conviction will come and your meditation practice may very well be the way for you to do that at this point. Um, so just ask yourself, is awareness within the edge, within the fence, or is the fence within awareness? And thus, if the fence, the entirety of that fence, that sensation is within my awareness of it, then am I not the one that's aware of it? and not the sensation of being fenced in. I think the tr thing that I'm choosing to see as a trick for me is that I can form this idea that you say within the confines of this mind, I can mentally construct that and say, oh, okay, I can picture that, I can believe that, I can see it in that way, that makes sense to me. That pacifies this mind, but I don't... And I can, you, can you keep asking yourself, what is seeing this? And then, oh yeah, I can make sense of that, but what's seeing that? Can you keep making <coughs> that 180 degrees turn before you turn around again? Every time you turn around 180 degrees, in a sense, you gain more of yourself, more of your perspective, and your view becomes wider when you look back again at experience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you turn to, into awareness, into where you're looking from. You're turning toward where you're looking from. And in that moment of asking yourself that and turning around that awareness into itself, for that very moment, whether you realize it or not, you're not aware of the fence. You're not aware of any experience that you were previously labeling. So you're actually sort of diving into deeper awareness and you're looking back at the experience from a more expanded view. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that you're never the thing that you're seeing. Like you're never obstacled by the thing that you're seeing. Mm. And if you have an obstacle and you're looking at the obstacle, the only thing that turns it into an obstacle instead of the past is if you have an idea of there's being something behind it. But if you don't have any idea of there being anything behind that fence, naturally the fence 
moves to the background, it moves be behind you in a sense. You are here. You're just looking in the other direction because there's no interest to you behind the fence. You're not creating an idea of something being behind the fence that you can't see. If you scrap that idea, there's just a fence. And then very quickly you look back and you realize you're free. It's not an obstacle, it's just an appearance. It's only an obstacle if you project that there is something beyond the obstacle that you need to get. But if you instead turn around and ask yourself, where am I seeing this from? Where am I looking from? Mm -hmm. It will expand you into more of that effortless awareness that already notices your entire mind, being, body, system. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I, I guess the, <laughs> the, the part that I'm, I'm very, I feel like an infant. Mm -hmm. But uh, me too. Okay. Um, is that I do that, but it's still always I want to turn it around and see where the what's projecting, but I I can't because everywhere I turn, it's coming. You know what I mean? It's coming out from me. Like mm -hmm. I can't. But can you just notice that that's happening? And does that not create some sort of? glimpse or awareness of the fact that you are not the thing you're seeing, but you're looking from a place of freedom? I think so. I think that's why I keep, this is still holding my attention so vividly. I think I, I, think I have some awareness or idea of that. Mm -hmm. And so how was your experience this week with admitting defeat with the um, Did it resurface in a sense, in a particular way, or was it sort of like, oh, okay, was it admitted in that meeting last week? And uh, Oh, it kept resurfacing. Um, I guess what happened was I, I feel like I, quote unquote, got the concept entirely as a concept. As an idea, I became aware of, okay, I get it, like I solved the math problem, mm -hmm. but that it didn't change much <laughs> in what I was experiencing. Um, I, and I, I think I can see it as, well, you know, if I, you asked me if I felt worthy, and one part of me said, yeah, I feel worthy, why not? You know, I'm just as worthy as anyone else. But I don't feel worthy because I'm not experiencing said worthiness of bliss and love. And so something must need to be tweaked or changed. So in that sense, I don't feel worthy yet. But I hope to be actually experiencing the worthiness. The idea that you presented was to throw away the idea of ever being worthy, that I was creating the reality of a word. This is what I got from it. Mm -hmm. The idea of a needing to be worthiness of this universal love or this all awareness and um, and that I can almost combine the two into one thing and see that that's just another thing that I created and it was able to experience but now I can experience mm -hmm. oh, all right. that, that's not necessary for 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 an edge for a, a boundary of myself to get somewhere mm -hmm. and I feel like I I understand it mentally and somewhat experientially, but but I'm not sure if I entirely know how that changes my experience. Do you feel yourself looking for compensation? Um, for compensation? Yeah, are you trying to compensate for the idea I am unworthy? Are you trying to prove it wrong, the belief? Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm trying to prove it wrong. I think I can give up on the idea that I need to become worthy mm -hmm. or that I need to hope for mm -hmm. worthiness right. and then I will be able to, once I'm worthy, then I'll have it. I think I can let that belief system go. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
And right now, do you feel you're in a funk <coughs> with the fence around you? No. No? Does, no. It, does it feel like an enjoyable challenge? Yeah, very much okay. so. Okay, so it's not a... you don't feel stuck, even though you feel stuck. I feel stuck, but I don't feel stuck. <laughs> really stuck. At you don't all. feel stuck about the fact that you're having the feeling of being stuck. No, no, I s it's it's a, it's these things that keep coming up that are brand new and but also feel familiar, and I get to toy with them, and they're very fun. Okay, great, awesome. Do you have any other question in this at this point? No. Well, great. Thank you so much for sharing. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anybody else had an experience this week of what we talked about? About the fact that you can't win from a belief? So that admitting defeat actually grants you permission to exit the game? Yes, I, I kept doing the exercise four and five times a day. And what I had was huge swings in, mm -hmm. in what happened. Um, so the days I could really feel like I gave it up, I was creative, I could, my thinking was even different. And then I would <laughs> go to sleep and get up and I would be bashing myself again. And I, then I would see everything that was coming at me as a punishment for some unknown thing I've done. Mm -hmm. And I'd keep trying, but so I had some success, but I kept getting lost in what felt like a fence. Like I would run into it, <coughs> and I could say the words, but I didn't mean them, so it, it didn't free me up. When I said them and I meant them, there, it was like being in a whole different space. Mm. Um, and I'm just keeping at it. Mm -hmm. If you have any tips, I love them. If you have any questions. <laughs> Can you? Okay, I'm this. Blah. Um, can you stay in that other level and not have to keep coming back to this crap I do? Can I stay there? It will be more like this. So you you do you just keep doing it? I mean, it's a long time I've been doing it. I'm really sick of it. <laughs> Have you been doing this, though? Well... Are you sick of this, or are you sick of trying to compensate? Trying to compensate. And are you sick of identifying whether you're doing well or not well? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you can stop that and still do the practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 will, I will give it. Yeah, with, no, without, it. without labeling, oh, now I'm... Mm. Okay. And I want to be there. Mm. Mm. Of course you know that you want to be there and not here. It's okay. a physical thing. You know yes. that you're not there. And that's a signal to do the work, to pay attention. Okay. But it doesn't mean that you're failing. Which is what I kept making. Which is, again, is part of the idea yeah. of being unworthy. I get it's it. That idea then sort of seeps through and then labels it as failure and, oh, I have to do it again and I'm still not good enough. I've still not reached yes. the promised land. I've still not reached that compensating state that can prove the belief wrong. That's exactly what I was doing. Mm. Yeah. So that which sort of wants to map your progress and look at it and analyze it and say, what can we do better? Yes. And But I'm so tired of looking at this. <laughs> it's only because that belief of unworthiness is what's looking at it. Yeah. That's where you're labeling it from. So if you label it from a different state of being, and again, maybe <laughs> it requires some work to do that, but it will pay up. If you label it from a different perspective, a trust perspective or a faith perspective, where there is just, ah, it's okay that I feel a little bit down right now. It's just a signal that I'm about to go up even higher. And it doesn't mean right or wrong, negative or positive. So if you strip it from those labels and just enjoy the presence, enjoy to the most, what's the word? Just regardless of your state of being, regardless where you are on your graph, find what you enjoy most about that moment. And if you shift your awareness to that, then instead of being this, 
It can be more like this. Okay. Know what I mean? Uh huh. I do because the days that I shifted, I was very happy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't mean happy like giddy. I just was peaceful and happy, and there wasn't there wasn't all this stuff that I do, mm -hmm. uh, which was very relieving. Mm -hmm. um, so Another way this could work, and could allow you in a sense to sort of skip a few beats. And again, the difficulty in talking about this is that, again, the belief goes, oh, yes, I want that, because then maybe I can prove it wrong. So uh, it's important that it doesn't come from a place of compensation, trying mm -hmm. to compensate, but just from a grounded feeling of, yes, I'm tired of cycles. I'm tired of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm tired of those ideas, definitions that I have <coughs> that create that idea of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm tired of identifying with the stuff that I know is not good for me, the stuff that I know is not me. If you have that amount of frustration and you can sort of see the, see the whole game and be fed up with it and have that almost resentment toward it, if you're in that state of sick and tired of the process, sick and tired of, that can actually be very viable energy if you don't go into the negative ideas too much, but you simply allow that frustration to become the source of your commitment to break all ties with that particular level of beliefs. Oh, and that, that makes sense, because I, I got very frustrated. Sure. I mean, I was in the cycle, not out of it, but I, I could use that energy. It's when you get frustrated like this, it simply means that you believe something that does not resonate with your spirit, your beingness. So what were you believing in that moment? about the yourself I, in, the, in, in relationship the, to your moods I was believing that I um, was not enough exactly and that I was not lovable exactly and then what happens is I set up a field and people react to me in a way that tells me I'm not lovable or whatever I'm believing at that moment and I know the difference because when I'm in the other place things just smoothly happen and go and everything's good and it's like and I just was like this at myself like stop it and I was um, it wasn't I didn't stop it I just churned because you wanted to compensate mm -hmm. so if you see that next time it happens just see that you're fighting a fight you can't win and if then still, if then still, you want to enjoy it, you still want to entertain that and keep churning, then it's completely out of your free will and it's actually not as bad anymore. Okay. So that can still happen too if you see it doesn't resonate, but for some reason you still want to enter that because you still perceive some value in going there. That can happen too. Okay. Uh, but at least you've admitted to yourself that you're trying to win a game you know you can't win. And so it doesn't make sense to you anymore. Now, if you keep doing it, there must be some value in that for you that you think, at least think there's in there. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. But you may still perceive or have an idea or belief about entering that compensational state, even though you see it's not worth it. And if you keep doing it, you believe that, you know, there must be something there. And that's yeah. why you're frustrated, because you're still writing a belief that is not... Doesn't fit anymore. It, it's not of your spirit, it's not of your being. Yeah. So what does that believe? That I'm never going to get it right. Mm -hmm. But if you see that, that's actually peaceful. Oh. Well, so what's the belief that keeps trying to win a game it knows it can't win? When it sees it can't win it, what do you believe about yourself that you still perpetuate that? And I know that say very well. It's very human, and it's sort of very intricate. So it helps to just look at that belief. What's the other belief, the sub-belief, to that unworthiness game that keeps you tied to the unworthiness game, even if you already have so much clarity about the inability to win the game? Okay. So what must you believe about yourself in order for you to go in that direction, even though you know you can't win? Or maybe up to this point, you didn't, in that state, realize that you couldn't win. But next time, if it happens, try to first, yeah. just try to realize that, okay, I can't win this. Ah, oh, I'm trying to compensate. I'm feeling frustration because 
I'm entering a portion of my consciousness into the belief, into the point of view. I'm looking at life from the point of view that says or believes that I'm not worthy and I need to prove that I am worthy. Then post yourself the, with the confrontational idea that you can't never win that. You can't win from that belief because that belief creates that reality. All you can do is opt out. See that it doesn't work, it doesn't resonate for you and say, ah, oh, thank you so much, you're absolutely right, bye-bye. And if at that point still, even though you have that clarity, if you still find it yourself, usually it will help tremendously and sort of free you from it. it but if you still feel an allegiance toward it, it's because of a sub-belief that you haven't seen yet okay. that thinks that there is some value in still trying to prove yourself, still trying to prove yourself right by proving the belief about yourself wrong. Right. Yeah. Basically, what we're doing when we're trying to compensate for a belief of unworthiness is we're creating this idea of the belief and myself. Within myself, I create the idea of the belief and myself. Now I'm going to prove to my belief that it's not right, it's not true, it's not accurate. But if you simply admit defeat, the game is over and you feel the worthiness that's genuinely there and that's not conceptual, that's universal, that's spiritual, okay. that connection. So see that you can't win the game whenever you get frustrated See that you're believing in an idea that doesn't work for you. And if you spot the idea, you're free from it. If you see that it doesn't make any sense to your being, you're free from it. Mm -hmm. And if even though you see it doesn't make sense and you still, yeah, I know, but I don't want to let go of this yet. Ask yourself, oh, well, what is it that doesn't want to let go of that compensational game yet? Okay, that's what I'll do next. Okay. Yeah, so in a sense, you. it's a two, two option game like step one is to see that you can't win it and that you're in the mode of believing the belief therefore you're trying to separate yourself from it and prove it otherwise seeing that it won't ever work uh, usually relaxes attention and if it doesn't even while you're seeing it clearly you simply ask yourself oh what must i be believing about myself in order for me to keep entering that okay even yeah. though i see it's not working yeah oh i what part of myself still believes that it is actually unworthy? Because that's what it is. The sub-belief is also the belief, I'm unworthy, I need to prove myself. The value it perceives in perpetuating that game of compensating for the idea I'm unworthy is to achieve worthiness within the belief system of unworthiness. It still wants to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's the same belief, but just in a different distortion. Yeah. So sub-beliefs are the same, are the main belief, but they're just dressed up a little differently, so sometimes we need to spot them as individual beliefs to really uh, root them out, so to speak. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. What else? of my mind now, the conversation that you had a little earlier, specifically the part about um, the fence. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the image is usually um, a wall or <coughs> a fog or um, something that a veil that has to be penetrated. Mm -hmm. um, and I got while, while you were talking, I mean, I, I, it sort of opened up that the only thing that makes that an issue is the belief that there's something I need to get to on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing on, that I need to get to on the other side of it, I don't need to penetrate it or climb it or break it down or make it go away. It's sort of like not being interested in what's in the backyard mm -hmm. when and yet, are happening in the front. Yeah. And Go ahead. And yet, it's not always that easy to stop projecting that there is a goal behind the wall. Yeah. And so to simply say to yourself, oh, if I just stop believing that, then I'm free, doesn't usually work because the original urge that latches onto the belief of a particular <coughs> goal, that urge is actually authentically yours. So, 
to let go of the idea of a goal behind the fence or behind what you perceive as the obstacle is actually partly natural. It's just dressed up in a distorted way. But it's actually your original desire for more of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you just simply say, okay, oh, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to believe that there is a goal behind where I'm at right now, that there's a greater version of myself behind where I'm at right now, that will be suppression. And it can work for a little bit because you experience the relief of not seeking something out of reach anymore. But really the, the total, the holistic way to go about it is to realize that you are what you're looking for. So again and again, it's like when you're hitting a wall and the idea is that there's something behind that wall, realize that you are the something behind the wall. And actually from the other side, you are behind the wall. It's just a matter of perspective. <laughs> So by realizing that you are the thing you're projecting is out there, it's actually a shadow version of yourself projecting or intuiting that you are over here. So that mental block or that image of the fog or of the fence or of the wall is simply your consciousness representation of the idea of obstacling yourself, of not believing that you are more than you believe you are. Yeah. So it's a, a, a visual representation your mind comes up with to explain to you, to show to you in a sense that you're not believing in yourself. And, and But it, it, it feels like you can't get to where you know you need to get to. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's the, the um, effective tone mm -hmm. of it. Okay, so that's, that's in the background of what I was going to say now um, about from last week. I mean, it was a big deal for me last week, and it continued, and um, um, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and things kept opening up out of that, you know, I mean, it was like that was like the Rosetta Stone, and, and then war things coming. And the biggest of those things, or the most um, emphatic, of those things was the over the weekend when um, when I actually had the experience of being able to have my partner with me. I mean, the you know that the that um, mound of sadness and you know like clay that was inside me of just sorrow that I couldn't I couldn't have her because. It just made me sad. It, you know, I mean, the loss was so intense that the possibility of her, as she was, was was not available. And then it happened that that went away. You know, I mean, and, uh, miraculously, and it was so dramatic and so palpable. You know, I mean, it was like I was lame and then I could walk. It was I didn't make it up. You know, it was very real, and it made me so happy. Mm. Um, the relief and the mm -hmm. lightness and the, the delight of just the pleasure of oh <laughs> you know oh so but here's my question mm -hmm. now and I, I I don't think this is look I mean I've looked to see okay or am I looking for trouble you know am I just running ahead to see what I what I can find to be a problem. I don't think so. But there is this now, today, this afternoon, something kind of just as, as pleasurable as that is and as much as I'm loving it, there is this me and Jane, Jane and me, me and Jane together again, you know, this sort of thing and this pride on my part of you know, oh, this is so good, and I got it, and it's wonderful, and I love it. Is that pride? I didn't hear pride in that. Well, it, I, it, it, uh, I feel some pride. I mean, there is, not in a, you know, seven deadly sins kind of way, but just a pers a way that is so... Happy? Identified. Happy? Yes. So yeah. where's the pride? Pride means not happiness. Well, it's... In, in, I did, then I, I mean, it's, it's the pride is part of the happiness. The sort of at last, you know, how how could this? I'm so glad that it feels 
like a child would be proud of having done something. This this is yeah, yeah, grateful. Great is very grateful. But there's this sense of I could get stuck here. Like if I stop here. You can't stop anywhere. Like you can't. It's not like you shouldn't. You can't. It's not possible. So you don't. Because I, to, I don't feel like I it. could stop here. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't mind stopping here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, then, take a pause. But okay. see that even taking a pause is not actually stopping. It's the further evolution of that particular experience. It's only the mind that calls it like, oh, I'm stuck, and here I'm stuck, and here I'm stuck, and here I'm stuck. It doesn't happen. Life is completely fresh all the time. Remember those billions of times per second refresh rate? Oh, yeah. So you How can't can I forget those? <laughs> you, you can't stop, you see? You can't stop. You can repeat the same reality for a while. And that's okay, but that's not stopping. There's just, there's something, Bentinho, that is so personal about this, and the preciousness of the personalness of it mm -hmm. that that's gonna pop too, you know, it's like <laughs> So it just needs to it needs to experience that. It needs to blossom. So no need to call no need to deprive yourself or your ego, whatever that is, of anything. Like, go for it. Enjoy what feels enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Without any self-judgment, without looking back. Because the moment you look, reflect upon yourself, that can be done in both, in two ways. One can be in the integrative way, in the upward spiral, or it can also be in the downward spiraling way, where it's actually just a lingering belief of, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of this enjoyment. Therefore, let's call this happiness that feels so personal, pride. Therefore, I'll need to enter another spiritual game for me to sort of battle that and try to get rid, <laughs> try to try to get rid or make sure, just make sure I'm not getting prideful because that would mean that Ramana Marsh or whoever would not love me. You know? <laughs> I would not be the ideal student of spirituality if I enjoy myself too much. That's not my concern. Okay. <laughs> it really isn't. Mm -hmm. May pride just be a a wrong, or a uh, not a wrong, but a, an unhelpful definition I, I, of your state? If you could just delete that word from mm -hmm. our conversation, because okay. I think it doesn't mean the same thing okay. to me as, as what, it's it's not a, not a problem. All right, my only point is, do you allow yourself to enjoy that experience and not have that observational mode on of, oh, this is personal, this is not personal, this is spiritual, this is not spiritual. As long as you don't have that, as long as it's an undivided enjoyment, mm -hmm. where you're not separating yourself out into or onto the position of the interpreter of your own experiences, but you're just living it and losing yourself in it. As long as that's the case, I don't care what word you use. So if that's the case, then it's all good. If not, then I'd say just enjoy and let go of any observational mode you have. Don't try to frame your process in this moment in any way. But if that doesn't sat satisfy your question, let's keep going. What was your question though? The moment you said, so here's my question, you brought up, you used the word pride, but you brought up that it's very personal. It's so personal and you're afraid to get stuck there. I and what's the I question? I then? guess it, it's something like it has to do with time, you know, with, time? with, with s the sequence of time, that as soon as this came in, not as soon, but very soon mm -hmm. after this came in, and it was like something that came in, mm -hmm. This there is this sense, and it doesn't feel like a problem, it just feels like part of awareness of oh, you thought you could stop here. You thought this would be everything and you wouldn't want anything else. But it's not going to stop here. This is, mm -hmm. this is going to morph into something else. And Jane is not going to stay, you know, this... And, and it isn't like, oh, 
I'll have to lose her again. It's like it's like this is just a phase, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, this is right. like within the levels. There are also stages, mm -hmm. and this feels like a stage, but not not everything. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be everything, and it, it's it's not everything. Mm. Well, just deepen in the enjoyment, not in the observational, rational mode. Mm -hmm. Not that you're having that per se, but just mm -hmm. don't go into that understanding mode or like trying to map it. Yeah. Instead, it will morph, but let it morph through joy, 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 yeah. joy. Yeah. Pleasure, 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 yeah. pleasure. Mm -hmm. Satisfaction, satisfaction, satisfaction. Love, 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 love. Not through any observational pro Oh. I've witnessed that I'm in this stage. Oh, where will it go from here? Let's see how can I take it from here. No, yeah. just totally yeah, losing. As, as losing you're speaking, yourself. I can, I can, I can feel that there's right. a sort of obligation yeah. to break it down and exactly. um, use it. Exactly. <coughs> and the sense, the intuition that you have is right that it will morph, because things always morph. Mm -hmm. So that's always right, but it morphs into even more pleasure. It doesn't morph into losing anything. Mm -hmm. It morphs into more pleasure. But if you step out of the pleasure to observe it and then realize, use your intuition from that moment that says, oh, it will change, you can use it in that detrimental way again. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, okay, this means that it's not meant to last and I'm not meant to be attached to it. And mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay. That was See my question I mean? and you've answered it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So go in the other way where you just fully lose all sense of causality, become a little crazy to society, and just like, like you could be in a mental hospital, except you're in your own house. <laughs> but you're like, nobody knows where you're at. <laughs> but you're so losing yourself in that joy that you don't care. <laughs> and that's the way for it to morph into an even greater expansion and a greater realization. At which point, when you make that move, when that naturally morphs, then it won't be like a loss because it won't be a forced wrapping of that stage. It will be through the enjoyment, it will expand into more enjoyment. And in that state of more enjoyment, whatever perspective of holding on was present in the smaller enjoyment, now no longer applies, you see. So in that sense, it will morph. It will morph into, morph into more pleasure. You've only just glimpsed the reunion. So what you're intuiting is more of the reunion, not less of it, because it's going to move into something. And that releases it. I, I got it. I, ah, I got it. It's, mm -hmm. it's open. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. Anytime you reflect back upon yourself, <coughs> it can go in one of two ways. Either the upward spiral of more worth, more realization of your innate worth, which is not a concept, but the, the existence of presence, which is total worth and ecstasy, of which we've only scratched the surface. So if you feel like you're about to lose something or lose an experience, you can either label that as fearful because in the past it has meant that you've deprived yourself from that experience and therefore it became less joy again. Therefore you're attached to that moment. But if you define it in an integrative way, in a positive way, holistic way, it will actually be more of that joy. So the change that you feel coming will be more of the joy and then you won't be clinging and you won't lose the little joy that you had because you're clinging. Because you're actually opening up to that joy. Because you're becoming less fear that you can actually lose joy and that you can actually lose worth and so the worth will expand the worth for more and more joy will expand and so instead of labeling it in a scary way that things change all the time it will become exciting because you realize things keep not only changing all the time but they're changing in all the right ways and it may be difficult to sort of believe that believe that you are capable of more ecstasy that you are worthy of more love and more communication with your higher self and more of the things you want. 
But it's true. And the more you see that, the more you'll define it in that way, the more you'll define change in that way, the more you'll build that loving connection with that part of your consciousness which is not um, which is not obstructed by any sort of level of unconsciousness that we may have separated ourselves into. And so that communication can actually be such a self-loving experience where you're finally, for the first time, you're actually paying attention to your worth. All it wants for you, all you want for you, all you want for you is to open up to that worth, to that love, and it's always being sent. It's not that we're not being sent or given enough love, it's always being given. It's that we're not receiving it. And it's actually such a, it's such an act of love to want your higher self, even though you may think it doesn't need it because it is unconditional love, but it's not entirely unconditional love. It still has an agenda, which is fine, a universal agenda. So when you're actually listening to yourself, to your worth, anything that resonates in terms of worth and joy and freedom and more of yourself, you're actually loving yourself back for the first time ever, and it rejoices. It says thank you. It actually says thank you. It's not like, oh, it doesn't need that. No, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you, as the kid that you are in an adult body, need, or, yeah, in a sense, need the love. And when you are given an act of love like that, that your heart melts like, I almost can't believe that I got this love from you or that I received this, whatever, maybe it's just a compliment or that just hits the right string and makes you feel, ah, worthy again for a moment. That's, in a sense, that's the same way the higher self feels when you start paying attention and you start thinking it for its signs instead of blaming it and, and uh, it actually feels like, ah, finally somebody listens to me. <laughs> finally you see me for who I am. You know? So you can build that relationship with yourself and it's really enjoyable, it's really pleasurable, it's really deeply enjoyable and loving and gives a lot of meaning to your life. And that's when things start to flow, like circumstantially, because you start to listen. The only reason why things don't flow is because you're not listening in the particular way that you're meant to listen. So that those signals of when things don't flow just be signals to not define that in any negative way anymore. Whenever something happens to you that seems to obstruct where you want to be, realize that it's only there so that you can get sooner to where you want to be. But if you label it in the way that, oh, this is an obstacle, what you're doing is you're not listening, you're not trusting yourself, you're not trusting you, the you that sees more than you can see. So when you do, ah, that opens up and sometimes the obstacle immediately removes because what you needed to learn to get to that joy you wanted was simply to no longer define it in a negative way. That's why it needed an obstacle in the first place. But sometimes that obstacle is actually to lead you in a different focus or direction that actually gets you there sooner and more expanded. It has an agenda for you. The higher self's agenda is for you to be more and more and more ecstatic, more and more of itself, more and more a whole being with it together. So build that communication and start to feel more and more that it is you. It's not just given to you, it's you giving it to you. It's the giver, you're just the receiver. But you are the giver too. It's not that the giver is not you, you see? And why would you want anything for yourself that's not in your best interest? The higher self is completely selfish. That's the big, biggest ego ever in that sense. It only wants what's good for itself ever, for all of itself, for all of its parts. And you're one part of you. And so you want all that's good for you. So when something happens in your life and you don't label it in a way that's actually thankful and that doesn't see it, if you're labeling in a way that doesn't see it as a way to move into even greater bliss, but you see it as a way to move into less bliss because you're less worthy and it means, oh, life doesn't work and you're not worth it, da 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 When you're doing that, that negative labeling that's actually when you stop the flow. That's when it stops working. It doesn't stop working, it just starts working in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So if you start appreciating the gifts that at first glance may seem negative, 
because that's how we've learned to label that particular situation. And all the bystanders would agree, oh my God, did that happen to you? Oh, I'm so sorry. He's such a bastard, or she's such a slut, or whatever. <laughs> you know. But if you don't go into that negative game, if you see that everything that happens in your life is given by the higher you with only one interest, one selfish interest, to create more joy for itself, for you, and you are you, you are you, you are you, as you, as one you. The only place where it doesn't seem to be one you is because we've turned that into a difference. But y there's only one you. It's the whole of you. So if you start to listen to the whole of you and realize that everything that happens in your life is with the best intention and with the best outcome if you learn to listen, then it's impossible. After all, it becomes impossible. I'm not saying it never happens anymore here, but it becomes impossible more and more and more and more themes of your life and more and more areas of your life to see it as a negative thing. When something happens that everybody else calls negative and everybody else pities you for it, it's like, why? No. <laughs> this is the best thing that can happen right now. And if you really start to see it in that way, you really start to experience it in that way. And that which may be so detrimental to everybody else and they may turn it for themselves into a victimhood story if the same thing would happen to them, for you, it's only an empowering thing. It's like, this is only a signal that I'm about to receive more of myself. This is more of myself, more of myself, more of myself. So if you start listening like that, the higher part of yourself, in that sense, is going to be very, very thrilled, very, very happy, excited, and it's going to reward you for that. You see? Sounds a little bit silly, but it's not going to reward you more than it already has. It's just that you start to receive the reward. The reward is always there. <coughs> but if you label things <coughs> in a detrimental way, in a way of complaint and victimhood and blah, 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 that's what the ego effect really is. If you start to define it in ways that work for you, that's actually the disappearance of the ego effect. That's not more ego building yourself up with pride or with whatever it is. No, that's actually moving into more of yourself and leaving the space where the ego effect can even effectuate itself. So just start to listen, and you'll be thrilled, and you'll be thrilled. And you'll feel that you both, use, both yous will be thrilled. We'll be thrilled. <laughs> and it will be like having intercourse with yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> <laughs> a deep ecstasy, more and more. Deep appreciation, a mutual appreciation. Because you're doing your part, which is simply to listen and receive. And it's doing its part, which is always does flawlessly, which is to give, to send to know how and when, etc., the timing of things. But if we can let go of the how, that's when we can truly start to listen. If we have an agenda for the how, we're basically not trusting <coughs> that our higher version of ourselves has a way better grip on these things. <coughs> See, we're trying to, we're just like, we're not even capable, we're zero percent. I was gonna say like we're, 0.001% able to guide our life, but in a sense, nothing. Like, we're not able to know how and why and what's in our best interest. So that's not our duty, you see. And when we're trying to take on a job that's not ours, that's when we get depressed, it becomes really heavy, it becomes a burden, backpack, victimization, sense of betrayal from the universe, from yourself, hopelessness, desperation, suicide, all these things. But if you simply start to listen, that's all you need to do. Stop figuring out the hows. It's not up to you how. It's up to you how. But why, wh why won't you trust that? Why won't you trust that the you will take perfect care of you? Because it's you. Wouldn't you take perfect care of you? If you were so much wiser and so much more established in pure unconditional love, would you not want the best for you? And that's what you is. Why not trust yourself? There is no universe that you, within, need to find your way. You don't need to find your way. That's the beauty. You don't need to find your way. You just need to think. Think yourself. And your only duty, your end of the deal, end of the bargain, bargain is simply to listen and to enjoy yourself. To listen to what resonates and go in that direction. That's all. It's really very simple. We've overcomplicated, you know, our uh, job description has become way longer than it is. It's just one thing for everyone. <coughs> Worry is nowhere in that list. 
not in the original list, but it's everywhere, all over the paper in our present list. Concern, how-tos, figuring out, <coughs> we're, not we're not managers. We're not meant to be managers. Like, our intellect is not meant to be manager. Our consciousness here, our physical focus is not meant to know things, like how and when and why. But if you can simply know that nothing ever happens, know how, when, or why ever happens that's not leading to more of your greater bliss and joy, then you start to listen, you start to uh, stop stopping yourself. You no longer stop yourself. It always flowed, it always worked, but you thought you had to. Nope, nope, I don't, this doesn't feel, uh, I don't want to go here, I want to go here. But really, if that naturally happens for you, and you start to listen, you can actually find the resonance in these things, in these challenges, because you're not labeling them in a negative way. You're not avoiding, you're not trying to manage things. You're letting go of the idea of time. Thus you're creating less of the sensation of waiting for something to happen, goals in the future, and more and more you just start to live naturally in the present moment without trying to be present. Just because it's your nature to be present, because it's your duty to enjoy the present as much as you can. Because if you enjoy whatever is given to you, if you say thank you to everything that's given to you, it will start to flow. Just say thank you. Thank you. The things you don't like, thank you so much. I know this is in my best interest. Not in a sort of, because you have to learn this lesson. No, I know this is in my best interest because it leads to ecstasy. It leads to unconditional love. So your choice is simply, do I want unconditional love or not? If not, then keep managing your life. If you do, then start to flow and communicate with your higher version. Start to listen. All right? All right. All right. All right. Good. All right. <laughs> well, all right.